it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce our poet tonight. I think you've uh, seen things in the uh, the paper about the uh, the reading. Francis Payne Adler is the author of uh, five books, two poetry collection, The Making of a Matriot, and Raising the Tents, and three collaborative poetry, photography books, and exhibitions that have shown in state capitol buildings and in the Senate building in Washington, D.C. Her poems and prose have appeared in a variety of publications, Poetry International, Calix, Bridges, and so forth. Most recently, and this was how I actually met Fran the first time, she co-authored Fire and Ink, an anthology of social action writing, which won the 2010 Four Word Book of the Year Award for anthologies. Her other awards include a California State Senate Award for Artistic and Social Collaboration, a National Endowment for the Arts Regional Award, and the New Millennium Obama Award. She's professor and founder of the Creative Writing and Social Action Program at California State University, Monterey Bay. She moved to Portland three years ago? Three years ago. She, she now lives in Portland and to, continues to teach online at CSU Monterey Bay. So would you join me in welcoming our poet tonight, Francis Payne Adler. Thank you, Tom. Did you know it's his birthday tonight? Oh, oh happy birthday. birthday. Yes, I it is. I got to spend some of my birthday. Here. Yes. I hope that wasn't a secret, Tom. No. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> you know, I really thank you for coming out on such a rainy night, but that's Portland, so if we didn't go out on rainy nights, we wouldn't go out. Um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to read tonight, I realized that since I moved here three years ago, I've never uh, done a reading that focuses on the work that I did that Tom was telling you about with a photographer when I was in Monterey and then before that when I was in San Diego over a period of 15 years, really. And I'd like to do that tonight. In fact, the first part of the reading will be that, and then the second part will be my more recent work. Um, I've given you on your chairs some photographs in the old-fashioned, low-tech version. I didn't know if there was a facility here for showing photographs, and besides, I didn't get it together in time, um, to project the photos while I read. So this is just a selection of several photos by Kira Carrillo Corser, who I worked with collaboratively from the four exhibitions that we did together. So I'll start with the first one. And before I read a poem, and I'm just going to read one or maybe two poems from each exhibition. Before I, I begin to read the first poem from the first exhibition, I want to tell you how it happened, how I started doing this, how we invented the form. And this is how it goes. I was a graduate student at San Diego State. And it was 1984, appropriately enough. And um, Edwin Meese, you remember that guy? The former attorney general under Reagan, said that there was no hunger in America. And I was, uh, you know, appalled. And then they proceeded to have a presidential task force look into it. A month later, they came up with the conclusion that there is no documentable evidence of hunger in this country. No, rampant hunger in this rampant. country. Rampant. rampant. Right. So uh, I remember sitting on campus. I was a grad student. I remember leaning across the table to a friend. You know how you lean in to talk to when you get heated up about a subject. How could this be? Who, who, what planet is he living on? Why doesn't somebody show him? Somebody take some photographs and, and write some poems and take them to the White House and show him. And my friend leaned back across the table and said, why somebody? Why not you? And I said, me? Me? I'm just a student. What can I do? Right. Well, of course, the very next morning I realized that, of course, I could do something, a little something. I could write. 
I could, you know, I didn't know how much I could do, but I could certainly write about it. So I called my friend Kira, who's, uh, you know, had been taking some photographs of the homeless, and I said, are you in? Do you want to do this with me? Do you want to witness what we know to be our truth instead of what they're trying to make us believe? And she said, of course. And so that launched us on our first exhibition. At that time in San Diego, there were 3,000 homeless. Um, I know that um, in, in the late 90s, I haven't checked since, but in the late 90s, there were 30,000 in mm -hmm. San Diego. I don't know what the numbers are here in Portland. I'm sure there are some in the audience who do, who could tell me after. So i just read one poem. The photo that goes with it, of course, is the young woman on a church window ledge, the very first photo. Los Desaparecidos. Like the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, I can't put out the fire, the memory of those who are disappearing. Like the mothers of the Desaparecidos who circled the presidential palace every Thursday in Argentina, parading photographs of the disappeared. I too parade photographs in my city. <clears throat> On Fifth Avenue, next door to the avant-garde theater, a young man who sleeps in the, in the crawl space under an apartment building turns his face from the blade of light thrown by patrons opening the theater door. They do not see him. On Washington Avenue, a woman with feet black and ulcered from walking the night disappears behind a wall of three in the morning food basket silence. In a La Mesa Boulevard house, a young girl who will not eat sharpens her bones the color of fine blue china and crawls under the tombstone pages of a fashion magazine. On Ocean Beach Boulevard, 7-Eleven shoppers do not see an old man with three coats and 70 years stalling death, sleeping on the heat exhaust of an ice making machine. In Argentina and El Salvador, men in uniforms in jungles and in office buildings might laugh at the fine way we mask mutilation. No death squads drip white handprint warnings down doorways of the desaparecidos here. No lie is poured over bodies to make bones vanish. In my city, the desaparecidos obligingly make themselves disappear. Well, we started out with a very modest book that went at this, to the opening of the exhibition and then um, printed it ourselves at local Kinko's. And then at the opening, there was a senator there from Sacramento, uh, Senator Wadi Deda. And he said, you know, Fran, he said, I have some legislation pending on the homeless. And nobody's paying attention to it. And I'm wondering if we brought your exhibition up to the Capitol building and put it up in the halls, if they might, you know, it might draw more attention. And we said, sure, of course. And we put it up there, but we didn't put it in the pretty marble halls where there usually are exhibitions of flowers and landscapes. No, we put it up on the third floor next to the legislators' offices, next to the dining room, next to the elevator, next inside the bathroom, anywhere that they would be. And they could not look away. They would busily walk by it very, you know, speedily, but they'd be caught by the photographs. And then later on, we would find them wandering back to read the story. So it was the photographs that caught the attention, and then they wanted to know more. Somebody who would walk by a homeless person on the street might never know their story, but in pretty frames, it wasn't threatening, and they could actually listen to the story. Then it went on tour from Capitol building to Capitol building. And the reason that it did that is the Coalition for the Homeless in Washington, DC heard about it and started taking it on tour around the country. And we, that was the form that got invented for us. We really didn't know what we were doing. We just wrote the poems and took the photographs and you know, got $50 here and $50 there to put it together in a frame and hang it up. But what happened was the viewer took it to the next point. And that was what was so delicious about it, because it got invented 
through a coalition of people working on the issue. Two years later, Kira was working at PBS, a radio st TV station, and she heard about women <coughs> who were pregnant and couldn't get prenatal care. And we, we, we started hearing these terrible stories. And eventually, in doing a lot of research and reading up about it, before we began to do our next exhibition, we realized that 600 women a month who were pregnant, who wanted their children, couldn't get prenatal care. And we're just talking, you know, blood pressure checks, vitamins, really low cost kind of care. And so that was our next exhibition. And this is out of print, so there's none back there. But anyway, I copied just one photograph from this one, and it's of Joshua. And before I read the poem, I should tell you that in my early years, way back, I was an emergency room nurse in Montreal. So it's not an accident that I began to be focused on healthcare issues. Moving from Canada to the United States was a shock. Uh, one, there's wonderful things going on here, and of course I'm now a citizen for many years and very proud to be so, but there are things. <laughs> So um, it was appalling to me that health care was a privilege instead of a right, and I see a lot of health. So that's the issue I've been working on the most over the past years. Joshua. I could hold you, Joshua, in the palm of my life, cut my 40 years around your hanging flesh, and say, what have we done? I could hold you say you are not my son hold you tell you lies that all babies are born as you are bound to breathing machines their bodies small enough to fit a hand and weighing less than two pounds that all babies are born equal that i can look you in the eye this is no lie that the moon of your birth night tracked your mother from hospital to hospital, spilled its cool light on insurance ledgers weighing your worth, that her fertile heart froze each time she was turned away, that at 20 I was a nurse starched and stupid with notions of night sirens unloading pain at emergency room doors as a call to care. I hold you, Joshua, in my palm your chest blows the breathing machine, and the walls of my denial tumble. The next exhibition, we did it two years later, so that was around 1990, um, was an outgrowth of that previous one. Uh, while we were talking to pregnant women, we began to read in newspapers many, many stories. And I don't know if you remember, there was a period of time that this was the disease of the year. And it was um, drug moms. They called them drug moms, not women who are pregnant doing drugs, but drug moms. And the stories in the newspaper were, were always from the point of view of the baby. And that's OK. And it's not good that the women were doing that. But there was never anything about from the women's point of view, why were they doing this? And so again, we started doing a lot of research and we started talking to a lot of women. And um, what we found anecdotally was that many of the women had been abused as children, either physically or sexually, and by uh, alcoholic fathers, grandfathers, family friends, babysitters. Um, and they were doing what they had been taught to do they were self-medicating. They were also threatened to silence, and there was no healing for them. And every time we spoke to a neonatologist or to some practitioner, midwife, we would say, well, what's the research in the field? We can't find anything. And they said, well, yes, you know, you're right. Anecdotally, that's what's happening. Nobody's done any research on it yet. Don't quote me on it, but that's true. Anyways, it turns out about two years after we finished the exhibition, there was research that came out of Colorado. 
and 60, to, no, 65 to 80% of women who did drugs while they were pregnant were physically or sexually abused. And so I'm going to read you two poems from that exhibition. It's called When the Bow Breaks, Pregnancy and the Legacy of Addiction. And that's the mother and child shadow photo that's next in your packet. So I use an epigraph at the beginning of the poem from Tessa who said, people don't understand when I try to be honest and tell them, yeah, yeah, I was an abuser, but yet I was abused. They don't understand that. Tunnel vision. At what time in the tunnel did the gentle inhabitants of her body pack up and leave? At what time did her father's beer take the house hostage? And she learned to live with too much sadness. He said I had to, and I better not tell. At what time did steel plank itself beneath her skin and ropes begin to bind her blood? What are these ropes? and how long the tunnel. The next poem, actually, I had a lot of fun writing this next poem. Um, I, I, I played with two vocabularies. One was a vocabulary of baby words, and the other was a vocabulary of drug words. I knew a lot of baby words. I knew some drug words. And so part of the research involved inviting my kids and their friends in to tell me more words. And I took the two columns of words and I put them together in a poem. And of course, they don't fit. Coca by baby on the treetop when the wind blows, crack jumps over the candlestick. Hickory, dickory, dickory, china white, see how they run. Three blind pacalolo crystal booze, the cradle will speed, spliff, iced formula, tweaking, happy hour, this little piggy, wa wasted rig, rattle rug, bong spoon, razor coke. Little Jack Horner sits in a crack house shooting oatmeal, corkscrew, nipple, six pack. When the bow breaks, the cradle will freebase, baby powder, speedball, Jack and Jill, shrooms, ganja, rings on her fingers and bells on acid, falls down, steps on a crack and breaks heroin, pacifier, hammered, toki, toke, potty, pot, crayons down will come ecstasy, marble, snorting, three blind, wired, freebie, freebase, humpty, horse, horsey, rasta, diaper, dust, doll, crack, crack, clock, sock, shoot, baby, cradle, and all. What happened with Struggle to be Born and When the Bow Breaks is that, again, it was a coalition. We uh, were discovered by the March of Dimes. They had heard about both of the exhibitions and came to see them showing in the East County Performing Arts Center in San Diego, and they funded the publication of the Struggle to be Born book, which was such a great, great thing. Um, but even better than that, they took it on tour around to their affiliates all around the country, and so both exhibitions went to about 13 or 14 states and then were shown in the Capitol building. And really what we found is that Art has a way of breaking through denial. And that goes for legislators too. <laughs> and what they did is in, in several states, there was you know, cause and effect. It's really hard to show that. How can art make something happen? And yet in Tennessee, when it showed in the Capitol building there, a legislator found some money or, you know, found a way to have one of the centers for uh, drug addiction have a new staff member, that kind of thing. Um, there were new laws put into place in California for the homeless. There was, um, I'm trying to think of what other kinds of things, really um, little ways that it opened doors in different places. And, 
when it showed in the Capitol buildings, there would be a coalition between the artist, of course, and the, um, the March of Dimes, but it was also the business community and the university, the students, the professors, the um, service providers. And that was a thrill to see that happening. The next exhibition, oh wait, I'm not gonna go right to the exhibition yet. I'm gonna go to this book, Raising the Tents, which is Calix, dear, dear Calix. Um, and I'm gonna read two poems from here. And this, this I did on my own without cure. This was not a collaboration. <clears throat> And the uh, photograph of the telephone to the dead goes with this. And it says copyright cure courser, but that one's mine. And here's the story behind the telephone to the dead. Um, I was in grad school this time in <coughs> Phoenix, Arizona, at Tempe, where I went to study with Rita Dove because there were very few grad school, very few professors who were willing to um, how should I say, who would work with somebody who did political poetry, and that's what I do. And Rita Dove very much was engaged in what I was working on. And so I went there to study with her, and um, I remember it was a Saturday night. I was sitting at my computer. I was writing, trying to write a poem to conjure up my mother, who had been dead for 15 years, and there were questions that I wanted to ask her that I hadn't known to ask her because I hadn't come to consciousness before she died. And no matter what I did, I couldn't, she, she wasn't having any part of it. So I said, well, I need something, some special kind of way of getting through to her. And I came up with this image of a telephone to the dead that was going to have a femur for a receiver and I decided I was going to build it. So I went to the butcher store. And in Arizona, I will tell you, um, this little butcher store had a, a moose over here on this wall and a <laughs> bear over here on this wall. And when I asked for a, suit, uh, um, a femur bone, the butcher said, well, what are you going to use it for, dear? <laughs> and something about the moose on the wall made me just say, oh, I'm making soup. And <laughs> that's just what I did. I took the, the, the bone home and I put it into a big pot. It was so big, it stuck out one end. And uh, then I boiled it up and turned it over and stuck out the other end. And then I dried it off and roasted it in the oven. And then I sh smoothed it out with some sandpaper and drilled a hole in one end. And, stuck the telephone cord into it, and uh, it works. OK, these are the instructions. And actually, I'm only going to read it in English tonight. Um, but it has been translated into Spanish and um, French and um, Hebrew, Chinese, Japanese. Hasn't been translated into Italian, Joe. So maybe, OK. Telephone to the Dead. Toward the end of the 20th century, the bone phone came into use. A large receiver made of sanded femur caught the frequency to the dead. You could only use it at night. You couldn't call collect. Sometimes you might get a busy signal. Someone other than you was calling the same dead. It was found that women called their mothers men their fathers. It was said that when you finally got through, you might find that nothing came out of your mouth. You might even break out in a sweat. The only questions that could be transmitted were those between the generations that had never before been asked.
Okay, this poem doesn't have a photo to it. Um, I was teaching at San Diego State at this time in the Women's Studies Department. Um, I was part-time lecturer, and this was a time, 1991, just before or during, no, wait, let me think. It was just, it was during the 1991 first Iraq war, Gulf war. And um, they wanted me to talk about women and war. And instead of a presentation, I wrote a poem. And this is the poem. <clears throat> Friendly fire. Someone wants to know how I feel about women and war, women and war. I mean, sending women. I mean, we're talking mothers here. Some kid, if the woman gets shot, loses his mother. Hey, they've been losing fathers down the tube since who knows when, but what the hell, no one ever sent a father home for the kid's sake. Fathers, I guess they figure father's expendable. Send the woman home, have to take care of our women. Send her home. Someone wants to know what I think about women and rape. Someone wants every six minutes a woman is raped, a daughter is raped, a wife is beaten every 18 seconds. Someone wants to know what I think, have to take care of our women, send her home, what I think. Send her home to raise the kid, the kid they care so much about, the one that will grow and go to war. Shortly after that time, uh, Kira was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And um, the unfortunate part was that, well, that was unfortunate enough, but um, she had fallen in love with a man who was living in Monterey. We were in San Diego at that time. And he had wanted her to move there. And so she finally did. And she had to quit her, chose to quit her job at PBS, where she had health insurance. Um, and for the first year that she was going to be in Monterey, she had decided that she would go without health insurance because it was going to cost her $460 a month for her and her daughter. This was not early 90s as much more now. Um, and so she said, well, I'll just, you know, I'll go bare. What can happen? I'm healthy. What can happen in a year? <laughs> well, six months later, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And it was horrible. It was just, you know, I won't even go into this. You all have stories, I'm sure. But what happened with her and with us is that we had a lot of friends who were in the medical business after all the years of working in this area. And uh, we finally got her on Medicare. So um, she. I wrote a poem for her. She can't even be in the room when I read it because she has to relive it. It's called Disembodied. And this is the very weird photograph that's in your packet of, uh, you know what it was? I, I said to her, it was hard for me to interview her about it. And I said, Kira, if you could, if you could think of one word that would describe your experience to begin talking about it, what would that one word be? And she thought a while and she said, disembodied, disembodied, she just completely take it apart. So that's her photograph of her experience. Um, that's the wig on, on the pillow with the hair coming out. That's her head floating in the air. That's some kind of headless body beside the bed and all the pills. That's her way, her representation of her experience. Disembodied. She wears the hang of a strong body, walks six feet tall, size nine shoe, holds the sky in her eyes. Think you can defeat her? You shall not have her, scorpion cancer. You shall not break her, you so-called healing profession, healing industry, medical, you supposed healing arms of government. You've heard of the horse of Troy, the wooden decoy hollowed out and filled with warriors delivered as a gift to the enemy. She too has a plan to resist the two-pronged attack to disembody her, the chemical warfare, her body, the battlefield, 
and the healers, laws that deny care for the sick. When the fine doctor tells her she has a growth in your ovary, she cries, remembering her mother in the tub and the scar where her breast used to be. And when he says, sorry, his hand already on the door, I don't take Medi-Cal, as if she doesn't deserve his attention, as if she's not a person and sick. She remembers, I loved to build forts as a kid in Georgia, to dig tunnels, to furrow through the dirt. And when the health insurance company on embossed letterhead denies her insurance because she's sick, you have a pre-existing condition. And when her government accuses her of being sick, finds her guilty of not earning money, requires her to call herself indigent to get health care, she's coming apart. She digs in. She's a fortress. When the gaping wound isn't healing her body, red, raw fish flesh, she's screaming, doctors screaming, scraping out infection without an anesthetic. I forgot, as if she weren't underneath, till you reminded me, resist. I forgot I could say no. When the nightmare begins after the chemo, surreal to wake in the morning and see hair everywhere, a pillow of hair, hair stuck to the walls, stuck to the tub, stuck to my hands. She's crying, looking in the mirror and crying. She's coming apart. And when she's inside the toilet bowl, lying, crying on the bathroom floor, retching four hours straight, this is the end. I've reached the limit. I can't take it anymore. And Keith, down with her on the tiled floor. You're a fighter. You're beating the cancer. You've got a lot to live for. She kept remembering her dream. I shall ride camels in Egypt. We called the exhibition A Matriot's Dream Healthcare for All. And the word matriot, many of you have heard the word, but for those of you who haven't, I vented it when I was in San Diego um, during the Gulf War. And I remember that the defense forces, our defense forces, had invented a missile and called it a Patriot missile. And I thought, okay, if that's what a Patriot looks like, why does Matriot? And I, I felt it needed a definition to go with it. So I made one up. It's got three parts. Matriot. Noun. One who loves his or her country. One who loves and protects the people of his or her country. And one who perceives national defense as health, education, and shelter for all of the people in his or her country and the world. The next three pictures in your packet go with this one tiny little poem. <clears throat> and I start out with a rather long epigraph from Newsweek magazine. I'll use anything in a poem, I'll tell you. I even have a graph in this exhibition. No, who ever heard of putting a graph in a book of poetry? Anyways, from Newsweek, <clears throat> early 90s, 1993, and the headline was, Healthcare Stock Expert Picks Places to Profit. You have to understand, pharmaceuticals have been the most profitable industry in the world. I took a very large position in Chiron, which makes beta interferon. That's a drug that in studies has shown dramatic reduction of symptoms of multiple sclerosis and an actual reduction of the progression of the disease. This is one of those drugs where there is no therapeutic alternative. People that have the disease, 300,000 in the US alone, are clamoring for it. We are talking about potentially a billion dollar drug. <clears throat> I call it turkey vulture venture. <laughs> Raise the price and praise the sick who need our drugs like water. 
Raise the price and praise the children who need our vaccines like milk. Raise the price and praise the elders. Medications are their mother air. Raise the price and praise the God of demand and supply. Raise the price and pass the champagne. Our stock is rising. <laughs> This is tough material, but I have fun with it every now and again. <clears throat> um, I think the next photo in your, your packet is also another odd one. It's very surreal. Uh, Kira it has a um, wonderful imagination. And um, the way we work together in a collaboration, and I should just say, if anybody's anticipating doing a collaboration, choose people that have certain qualities, people who you respect, people you can count on to do their fair share of the work. And um, that, that's the main two ingredients. And the way, the, way it works, it, the way it worked with us is that it wasn't that her photographs were captions for my poems, or vice versa, my poems, captions for her photographs. It was, <clears throat> we would come up with certain kinds of images, and then it was amazing how they fit together. And when we would go interview somebody, I would interview them and make of their words a poem, or else I'd respond with a poem. And Kira would be taking photographs, and there would always be a photograph that just would be in sync. So it was two separate art forms that then became a third art form together. <clears throat> so the story behind this very interesting photograph is um, when Kira was very ill and she had a very, she was very hot and uh, she had, you know, her ovary out so she had an instant hy hysterectomy and you know how that goes. So she's having these terrific hot flashes and the nurses used to bring her um, Instead of an ice bag, they brought rubber gloves with ice cubes in it. And it was so bizarre. And she said, you know, our next exhibition is going to be about people who can't get health care. And this is going to be in it. This image, I'm going to use this image. And I don't know how, but I'm going to use it. And so um, let me read the poem, and then I'll tell you what. what What's that one? It's very short. It's called The Turned Away Ones, meaning all of the ones that couldn't get care. And we're talking in 1992, when I, we were doing this, there were 37 million people without health care. And the last time I checked, it was uh, 50 officially but it's way more than that. And um, Families USA says, and this was three years ago before the big crash, there were 75 million. So we're talking a lot of people. The turned away ones. They'll come back through the pipes, the turned away ones. They will come from the other side, up through cellar doors, basement stairs, and squalling hospital elevator shafts. They will not be silent. So she started out with ice cubes, but they kept melting. <laughs> so she used broken up styrofoam. And it was even better because then they were like arthritic hands. <clears throat> And this um, last piece that I'm going to read from the Matriot's Dream exhibition is, um, is a prose piece. And it's called, uh, you know, because we kept hearing stories of people going into hospital and being afraid to go into hospital. I mean, not only the money issue, but that they would have to have somebody that loved them very much beside them all the time, 24 hours a day because of the mistakes we were hearing about. 
you know, wrong medications, wrong amputations, infections. So this is called the tale of the body shields. And in brackets, a story with some ridiculous generalizations and a happy ending. So that's a disclaimer. These are terrible generalizations. The tale of the body shields. Once upon a future time, one day in the first year of the 21st century, ha ha ha, a sick person walked through the woods. She was wearing a white body shield to protect herself. She was on her way to hospital. She walked through some trees, up a hill and down the street, and a sick child saw her. The next day, the child wore a white shield with a bold red cross like the ones painted on medical trucks in war zones. More and more sick people began to wear body shields. And when a critical mass formed, something forgotten was remembered throughout the land and the old ways of caring about the sick were revived. Doctors forgot their golf club membership fees <laughs> and remembered their Hippocratic oath to heal the sick. Hospitals forgot their CEO's private plane and remembered their origins as healing houses. Lawyers forgot their Porsche payments and remembered their principles. Insurance companies remembered their intention to, prevent, to protect the sick and transform themselves into the prevention business. Legislators remembered Eleanor Roosevelt's Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 and declared the right of everyone to medical care and security in the event of sickness. And shields were painted and hoisted in the streets, decked with ribbons and flowers and virtual reality. There was jazz and salsa dancing and carrot juice cocktails and the great festival of health rose throughout the land. <laughs> what an optimist. <laughs> you gotta keep your sense of humor. So this exhibition traveled, you know, to many, many states, and then it showed on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and uh, the Clintons were in White House then, and we invited Hillary Clinton to come, and she didn't, but her chief of staff came and at, to the opening night, and it was pretty darn exciting. Mm -hmm. So that's it for the photographs, folks. How are you doing? Too much? No. no. OK. Just checking in. <laughs> Okay, so um, you know the definition of the matriot. Now there's a poem that goes with it. And the story is this. Um, Kira's grandmother-in-law, um, Helen Vandeveer, was 87 years old and an activist all of her life. And um, no, I got to back up. There's a little piece before that. We were driving up to San Francisco from Monterey to um, a health Healthcare Access Foundation. They were keeping testimonies of people who couldn't get health care. And we were going through their files and trying to find people that were, you know, willing to tell their story. And uh, Kira had a Jeep and she drove it into the parking lot, and there on the wall was some graffiti. And it said, Revolution, the day has come. She grabbed her camera and she took a photo. And then we went to dinner at her grandmother-in-law's house. And um, we were talking about this. And somebody at the table said, OK, I'll admit it was a guy. He said, a lawyer. And he said, well, girls, <laughs> you know, if you really want to change things, you might want to consider taking out the R word. Right. And that's going to turn people off. And you really want to bring in as many people as possible to this idea, which is true. But we looked at each other. And this is no way the word is coming out. But you know, I mean, he, he had a good point. We needed to think about 
who it would turn off and how could we transform it, still use it, but how could we transform it into something that would be more inclusive? So we looked across the table at Helen and there she is, she's 87, she's sharp, brilliant, tough, and eager. We said, Helen, you want to come down to, to Market Street tomorrow and pose beside the graffiti? Sure. She was up bright and early and she put on her black pearls and her black dress. And, and she took us, we took her down in the Jeep and she's getting out. And now here's the thing is that although she was physically really solid, her feet were giving out. So she was walking with a cane. So she's walking across the parking lot like this, right? And she said, I know you girls just want, she didn't use the word girl. Um, you just want me to play the little old lady, right? <laughs> and we said, no way. And she said, all right. And that's when Kara took the phone. <laughs> that's the story. Yeah. Yeah. So then after we took the photo, <clears throat> we took her to lunch and I told her the definition. And I asked her, Helen, if you were in charge of the national budget, what would you spend it on? And she said, me? You know, so remember what this little student who said, me, what can I do? So that was her response, too. She said, me? Nobody ever asked me what I would spend it on. But she proceeded to spend two hours to tell us what she would spend it on. <laughs> and the, this is the poem. These are her words, except for there's three lines in here where I'm kind of commenting on what she's saying. <coughs> Matriot, Helen Vandeveer, born 1904. There's not much that's important at my age except making the world a better place. What would I do? I say we damn well better get out on the streets again. Everyone has to put their hand to the wheel and get out and get off their butt like we did in the 60s. We had compassion then, and we've lost it. It breaks my heart. I've lived through two depressions, two of them. Everyone at that time was just sick about the way things were, just like now, only it's worse now. I see things falling apart, people living on the streets, children beaten in their homes, sick people without health care. Imagine this in a country that spends so much on the war machine. I'd spend the money on health instead. I'd see that children are born healthy and make sure they stayed that way. All children, no matter what age. I'd clean the air, the water. I'd take away all that polluting shit they put on vegetables. I'd promote the use of sun, sea, and wind for natural energy. I'd save the forests, especially the redwoods. I'd ban firearms. I'd take away every <laughs> nuclear device, man to man. No more wars, ever. Now, we're talking health. How are we gonna pay for all this? No one ever says we don't have enough money to go to war. No one ever says we don't have money for national defense. This is national defense. That's right. Right. <clears throat> it was at this time that I got hired at California State University, Monterey Bay, in, in, um, in an area that uh, there's a large Latino population. And that's the reason that the university was started there, because of the demographics and the need for a university that wasn't there to service these, this particular group of students. And the university was founded on the principle of social justice. And it's like, if I hadn't been hired, I would have had to invent a university to do that because the job was just had my name written all over it. And, and I was so grateful to be there. At the end of the first year, we worked in, in it. I should say this. It was the former Fort Ord military base. They closed down the base. And then we transformed it into a university. So we worked like 80 hours a week the first few years. Um, but at the end of the first year, during that summer, when I finally could breathe again and write again, I went to the head of physical facility, who happened to be the commander of the army base from before. 
and I, his name is Hank Hendrickson, and I said, Hank, when you see something, and you see a building here, you see it with two sets of eyes. I just see what I see. I'd like to know what was here before. Can you tell me about it? So he took me around the whole day. We walked, we talked. And this is the poem that came out of it. <clears throat> it's called Possibility. In 1991, Fort Ord, a military base in California for 80 years, is closed down. In 1994, California State University Monterey Bay opens on its ground. Who would have thought it possible to call the troops together in the mess hall one morning? Monterey fog not yet burned off and say we're closing down the base. Who would have thought it possible to load guns and missiles into crates, artillery onto trucks, cannons onto flatbed railroad cars to board up the windows of the barracks? And the grass grew long and quickly took over the fields. Thousands of soldiers marching down into Garrison Road dwindled down to 12, then none. Who would have thought it possible to transform the chapel that held the Panama coffin of Sergeant William Delaney Gibbs into a music hall that swells with the sound of the poetry of Sekou Sundiata and the sax of John Purcell? Who would have thought it possible to turn a blood bank? When we go to war, we carry with us our own blood into an environmental research lab and students after the microscopes and studies marching against strawberry blood laced with methyl bromide. Who would have thought it possible to board up the soldiers club with its great oak wood bar and glass walls leaning the ocean at Fort Ord, named after a general famed as an Indian fighter. And two years later, for Andrea Woody, a student in the Institute of Community Memory, to dig down, to research, to call her Cascade grandmother back to her, to hold her photograph, her letters in her hands. Who would have thought it possible to transform Jeep and tank garages into public art studios the radio transmitter station into state-of-the-art computer tech, the artillery vault into an online library, the battalion headquarters into the president's office. Who would have thought it possible to transform a survival training station into a child care center, to turn parachutes into small sweaters hanging from hooks, gas masks, into little laughing, shoving mouths at the water faucet. <laughs> Who would have thought in the unused rooms of the campus, soldiers' beds would still be piled, years and years of soldiers' beds, mattresses still ticking with cigarette burns. Who would have thought students would now walk back and forth with their books past these boarded windows and inside the eyelids of the war dead would open, flutter like hummingbirds. <laughs> I think uh, I'm supposed to end at an hour. Where's Tom? So I'll read one more. Well, we're fine. Okay. okay. Time for questions. Yes, and one more poem and then questions. I'm going to end with the broadside poem. And this is a poem Oh no, I'm going to end with one more after that. OK. This is a poem that I wrote for my kids. My son and daughter-in-law were getting married 16 years ago. Ah! <laughs> and they invited me to write a poem for their wedding, and I was very intimidated. I mean, that's what do I know about marriage, you know? I was married for 21 years, and then I left, and hey, what do I know? But anyways, I decided I would do it, and I assign myself a form. You know, there's villanelles, there's haiku, there's sonnets. I assign myself a form, and this was the form. I could only work on it when I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean really happy, like I was sowing happiness into the poem. 
invention for Molly and Mike. I wish you love, the bright kind, the filled with light kind, the beside you in the night kind, the side-splitting laughter upside down Ferris wheel ride kind, and the wide kind, the expandable, elasticized, durable, tough as hide, work out the rough times kind. I wish you words, the dear kind, the have no fear kind, the I'll always love you kind, the clear kind, the I hear you kind, the we're different and don't always have to agree supporting each other to grow kind. <laughs> I wish you health, the working up a sweat running to the bread store kind, the organic food kind, the tall tree clean air kind, the balls in the air give me a break, tearing down the stress, music is a must kind. I wish you kids, the wealthy in health kind, the such a cute tush kind. <laughs> the gritty hands from sands at the beach, singing at the table, arms around your neck, strong as a transatlantic cable kind. The Sunday morning lolling in bed kind. The red hot chili bumping car willies, all day long sillies, dollies and bikes, lollies and Nikes, and years and years and years of I remember when I was a kid kind. <laughs> I wish you vision, the let's recreate marriage kind, the let's reimagine the institution from scratch kind, the loosed from its moorings, no more obscuring, handed down versions kind, the turn of the 21st century, you've got all you need to invent the exponentially Molly and Mike kind. <laughs> When, when Tom asked me for a poem for the broadside, I decided on this one because this is the poem that I get the most requests for copies from. <laughs> and people come up to me and say, can I use it at my niece's wedding or my grandson's wedding? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes again. <laughs> Just attribute it and change the names. <laughs> the last poem I'm going to read is from the new collection, the Fire and Ink book, which was such a pleasure and so difficult. To do it took us six years. I collaborated with two of my colleagues at um, Monterey Bay um, Creative Writing and Social Action Program that we had there. And the way we did it, we didn't put out a call. This is, you know, activist poems, stories, interviews, memoir. We didn't put out a call. We had, the program was 14 years old then. And what we did is we collected together the, the, the material, the pieces that had most influenced our students semester after semester, the ones that had consistently inspired them to write, to break open their silences, to speak out for social injustice, to protect their communities and their families through their art. How do you write a poem? How do you write a story? And then more. How do you take it beyond the page into the community? for social justice. And so that's what this is, is 100 writers in here. And each of us has a couple of pieces in here, but it's mostly you know, uh, contemporary American, a few uh, from around the world, but mostly contemporary American. And I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna end with a William Stafford poem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And it's the one I love the most. <clears throat> At the Unnational Monument along the Canadian border. William Stafford. This is the field where the battle did not happen, where the unknown soldier did not die. This is the field where grass joined hands, where no monument stands, and the only heroic thing is the sky. Birds fly here without any sound, unfolding their wings across the open. No people killed or were killed on this ground, hallowed by neglect and an air so tame that people celebrate it by forgetting its name. Thank you. Thank you.